last two cards of our short Supreme Court section here, and then we're going to hit bureaucracy to finish out unit two. Um, 2.65. We've got 2.65, 2.66. So we're talking about, first off, legitimacy of the Supreme Court. And legitimacy just means like our ability to like accept what the Supreme Court is doing and deciding. So do we think that what the Supreme Court is deciding is legit? And therefore we'll accept it. Or do we just like roll our eyes to the Supreme Court and begin to ignore it? And that just depends on how political we think the Supreme Court is acting. All right. So backside. So one of the reasons this issue comes up is because the Supreme Court sometimes will make controversial or unpopular decisions. And that makes the public question the court's legitimacy. Now, the reality is that if you look at polling, if the Supreme Court makes a liberal decision, suddenly all conservatives say like, oh, the court sucks. And then if the court makes a more conservative decision, then the liberals start screaming like, oh, the court's terrible. Like what the world? Um, so it kind of just runs both ways. <laughs> um, there's rarely a time when the Supreme Court makes a decision and both sides are happy. That's That'd be a rarity. All right. Um, also, and wh why is this legitimacy an issue? Well, you have life tenure, right? Life tenure, and they have the power of judicial review, which means that there's little accountability in the Supreme Court. Like, it's great that life tenure has been done, right? I mean, that's a great thing because Hamilton said that it allowed fair and stable uh, value, uh, stable administration of laws, and they're not po as political. But at the same time, like, if they're making controversial decisions on cultural issues and it ticks off a lot of people, well, now suddenly they're not very accountable. You can't get rid of them. I mean, you can impeach them for, uh, you know, if they commit a crime, but how many Supreme Court justices ever done that? So the problem is, is that there's little accountability in the Supreme Court and therefore people start to think like, why should the Supreme Court have the power to make these massive rulings when we elect our representatives to make those decisions. So now all of a sudden, you know, this life tenure thing starts to become a little bit less obvious as a good thing, right? So last part here, that's kind of long. I apologize for its length. Um, I'll read it a couple of times as you write. So that way you can listen to me and write as I, as I say it. All right. So Congress and the president can only change the, with future appointments. They can only change the Supreme court with future appointments, future amendments, changing its jurisdiction or refusing to implement decision. Now we're going to talk about that in a second on a card, but I just wanted to emphasize that again. So Congress and the president can only change the Supreme court with future appointments, amendments, changing the jurisdiction of the court or refusing to implement a decision. That's it. That's the only accountability it has. So, uh, that could cause people to decide that it's not legitimate because it's nine people in robes who are unelected and unaccountable to the people. Therefore, why should we listen to those decisions? By the way, I'm making the argument here um, against um, you know lifetime tenure, but we also looked at Hamilton and looked at the arguments for lifetime tenure. So you can see that either side could make legitimate arguments. All right, cool. Uh, moving on to the last card of the of the judiciary section. All right, 2.66, restrictions on the Supreme Court. This is going to be a little bit of review, and that's fine because we need to keep getting into our mind how to restrain um, or restrict the Supreme Court if it makes decisions that you disagree with. This is an important thing from you know just a practical standpoint in life, but also uh, from our writing standpoint. It's very possible you could get an essay where you need to, you need to um, look at a situation and then find out, like, what would you do if you disagree with the Supreme Court's decision? Or what could Congress do if it disagree with the Supreme Court's decision? What could the Supreme president do if it disagreed with the Supreme Court decision. So this is a very fundamental practical card here. All right, 2.66 backside. All right, so first off, congressional congressional legislation um, to modify the impact of a law. So the Supreme Court, if it rules on something you don't like, it could change the law a little bit to make it not as impactful. Uh, so and that just kind of means like changing the law slightly. So one example of that is burning the flag. So in 1989, in a case called Texas versus Johnson, it was ruled that burning the flag was a free speech. And this was very controversial at the time. And literally the American people went nuts when this happened. Um, and they thought this was wrong. What ended up happening is that a lot of state legislatures passed laws. Um, and basically you had to get a, 
a permit in order to burn the flag. So they, they would they would arrest people for burning the flag, not because they burnt the flag, but because they didn't go get a burn permit to do it. And by the way, most people who are going to burn the flag didn't have two thoughts about going and getting permission to burn the flag. So usually they got arrested. So this was something where like, all right, we'll work our way around it here. So you modify the law somehow in order to um, still be able to uh, get the end that you want uh, in terms of government. Two, and this is the most common way to deal with a Supreme Court decision you don't like, and that is a constitutional amendment. And that's the most sure way of doing it. The problem is it's really hard to get a constitutional amendment. We know it takes two thirds of both houses and three quarters of the states to approve an amendment. So this is hard, but it's been done actually multiple times. You, you don't have to write what I'm about to put down. I just want to give you examples of when this has happened. Um, so just sit and listen to this. This is really critical just to understand the idea. So um, examples of constitutional amendments passed to overturn Supreme Court, this Supreme Court decisions. So uh, the 11th Amendment overruled uh, a part of the Constitution about court jurisdiction having to do with states suing each other or people suing states, I should say. So that actually um, was because of a, a Supreme Court decision that had come, happened in the early 1800s or the or 1790s, I'm sorry. And um, so that was an amendment that overturned a court decision. Um, the 14th Amendment, um, which gave citizenship and equal protection to African-Americans, that overturned the Dred Scott case. Matter of fact, let's look at that really close. Dred Scott said in 1858, blacks had for more than a century before been regarded as being of an inferior order and altogether unfit to associate with the white race, either in social or political relations, and so far inferior that they had no rights which the white man was bound to respect. So this decision going against the sort of philosophy of all men are created equal and a lot of the, the states in the North and what they had ruled and, and treated African Americans very differently than the South, um, this overruled it and said, no, nope, they can't be citizens, sorry. Um, and this, this is a terrible decision that's not based in the Constitution at all. Um, it, it is one of probably probably the worst decision of the Supreme Court. Um, Plessy v. Ferguson is right up there. But the point is this: the Fourteenth Amendment overruled this decision because um, the Fourteenth Amendment said all persons born or naturalized in USA in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. So guess what, Alabama or Georgia or North Carolina or whatever state, you have to allow blacks to be citizens. You don't have the right to just say they're not. Um, the 16th Amendment, income tax, was overruled a constitution, um, uh, a Supreme Court decision that said the income tax was unconstitutional. The 19th Amendment, a women's right to vote, overruled a Supreme Court decision which said the 14th Amendment, although it applied to black men, did not apply to women. The women rights movement tried to get the 14th Amendment to apply to women, um, but it, th this 19th Amendment overruled that. All right, so that's, that's some examples of constitutional amendments. Next, future judicial appointments and confirmations. So one way to change the court and its decisions it makes is through future future judicial appointments and confirmations. And what we're talking about there, go ahead and write this, is we're talking about the ideology shift, the philosophy of judging. So do you appoint more activist judges so you get more decisions that are more liberal? Or do you appoint more restraintist judges so that way you get decisions that are more restrained and are more conservative? And so if we get a Republican president, then we're going to get one type of judge. If we get a Democrat president, we get one type of judge. If we have a Democrat Senate, then they're going to approve a certain type of judge. If we have a Republican Senate, then you're going to have certain type of judge. So that's going to impact the court's um, ideology. And remember, since light, lifetime tenure, judges are uh, influence going to last for, for decades after the president is gone. Um, you can see here, just very quickly look at this graph. Uh, 50% is like, the, the, the question is, how, what is the percent of rulings that are conservative or considered conservative? Uh, and you can see the Warren Court from 53 to 69. Um, the percent that were conservative is really low. Look at some of those years, like only like 20 to 25% of all the decisions were what we would call a conservative bent. But then some judges retired and they got replaced by Richard Nixon, who's Republican. He had a different philosophy. And all of a sudden, look at the Burger Court from 69 to 86. Boom. Now all of a sudden it changes. And then the Rehnquist Court and then the Roberts Court. Uh, and a lot of the judges appointed on these courts um, were a more Republican appointees. 
And so you get a little bit more, you get a more conservative kind of bend to the court. Another uh, very rare, but it can happen, is that presidents or states evade or ignore decisions. Two most famous examples, or infamous, um, depending on your opinion, uh, certainly the, the Jackson one's kind of infamous. I already mentioned it in another lesson, but like the Cherokee decision in the 1830s, where um, Justice Marshall says that Jackson cannot force the Cherokees to move from their land, and Andrew Jackson says, Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. And he's making the point that like Marshall couldn't enforce his decision unless I, president, in help enforce it. And so since he didn't, the Cherokees were moved. Um, Abraham Lincoln also, uh, during the Civil War, arrested people and put them in prison um, without um, due process. And the Supreme Court ruled he couldn't do this. And, and Nick, uh, Lincoln just ignored that. He's just like, what? Oh, like later he basically was like, oh, wait, what? You guys made this? Oh, I didn't even know. Heck, sorry about that. So that is a, uh, a couple of examples of presidents just evading the decision. Legislature changes the court jurisdiction. So this doesn't happen very much, but theoretically, uh, the the Congress could come in and say, "Hey, guess what? You can't rule on this uh, issue anymore." And lastly, citizens have power over the Supreme Court because they can vote for presidents and senators who will confirm the judges that you want. So if if you have a really important issue that you know could come before the Supreme Court. Um, then you might decide to vote uh, for president or for senator based on that dis that sort of issue. And there are people who vote for president, and and the number one thing they're thinking about is um, judicial uh, rulings. All right, uh, there you go. Those are the ways that you can change the uh, outcome of a court. Uh, it's not very easy, and boy, you have to play the long game because none of these things are quick decisions or quick actions that happen. All right, thanks, guys. Make sure you study this one. This was really important for our essays.